Cummins Peterbilt Super Truck sure is an eye catcher. There's some pretty dramatic aerodynamic action going on here, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. In this video, we're going under the hood and between the frame rails to suss out what makes this truck so efficient. 86% more efficient to be precise, and that's nearly 20% better than the project's original goal of 68%. I'm Jim Park with today's trucking's ultimate test drive. This isn't your typical test drive. We aren't evaluating this truck in the way we normally would. Instead, we're looking at the individual components that contribute to the overall efficiency goals of the project. Let's get started with the engine. The engine's responsible for almost half of the overall efficiency gains here. Cummins made several changes to the base engine like altering the shape of the piston bowl, increasing the compression ratio and optimizing the injector specifications and calibrations. They optimized the gas flow through the engine, they increased the efficiency of the turbocharger, reduced some of the internal friction between components and used more efficient coolant, fuel and lubricant pumps. Cummins also modified the emissions calibrations to allow the engine to operate at higher NOx output levels for better efficiency, but they changed the NOx reduction strategy in the after treatment system to take care of the NOx problem at that point. And then there's the waste heat recovery system. It's the most complex part of the truck and arguably the most interesting. This truck represents the very first time a waste heat recovery system has been installed in a working commercial vehicle. The uh, waste heat recovery system is actually a parallel system. It's basically a refrigerant system that runs in parallel to the engine. Uh, it takes heat that is normally re rejected in various places off of the EGR and off of the tailpipe and it's used to heat up a special refrigerant that runs back through a turbine expander. This turbine expander spins at about 35,000 RPM. It then goes through a gear reduction cycle into a gear drive that runs into the forward engine accessory and just ultimately just puts it right back into the crankshaft. So it's, a, it's essentially a power plant, power plant on the power plant. Just to be clear, this installation isn't ready for prime time. It's still very much an engineering work in progress. For the purposes of this project though, Cummins proved it can be made to work. Now it has to be refined and made cost effective so the market will accept it. Cummins has told us they're striving for an 18 to 24 month payback on the system. So from this point forward, I think Cummins has, has, has learned a lot about the integrated aspects of the waste heat recovery system. I think having gone from a lab environment to a truck environment and working way more closely with us, they realize that how deeply embedded the waste heat recovery system is in the truck is going to dictate its success or not. I believe Cummins is looking further to kind of dial back the system to achieve more efficiency but keep it within the engine compartment in future evolutions. There is no doubt that there is energy be harvested that could improve the efficiency of their engines. I think the economy of scale and the price point is going to be the sensitive aspect of it. Moving back along the drivetrain, the transmission also plays an integral role in improving the powertrain efficiency. What we have in this truck is a, a production hardware UltraShift MXP transmission with a special downsped calibration. I say downsped because one of the energy saving benefits that Cummins did in order to run at a more efficient point in, the, in their uh, drive profile was to downspeed the drive profile from 1,350 RPM down to about 1,150 RPM. In order to do that, we had to change the gear ratio of the, of the rear axles and come up with a transmission that enabled that downspeeding. And we were very concerned about you know, what drivability would feel like at 1150 cruise speed, but we haven't really noticed a significant difference and we know that there's nowhere to go but up from here. And finally, the drive axle. It's a 6x2, meaning that only the forward axle drives the truck. The rear axle just goes along for the ride. So the additional powertrain changes, we went with a 6x2 rear tandems on this truck to it not only took off 450 pounds of weight of running a second differential but the, and the inner axles, but also the parasitic losses of running, spinning and churning that oil in that second differential. Now to compensate for the fact that we don't have the same tractive power of a, in a 6x2, 
we put on a Bendix E-Track system that is weight compensating. And when it, what that means is when it detects a difference in wheel speed between the two tandems, air is dumped from the non-driven axle to the driven axle, weight transfers in that case, and you get near 6x4 functionality out of it. To be honest, we did have one questionable traction moment on the test drive. It was on a hill on an uneven gravel surface. With a 6x4, I would have simply engaged the differential lock. With this one, I just paused for about 10 seconds and let the E-Track system redistribute the air pressure in the rear axles, and I was on my way to the races. It's no big deal once you get used to it. Peterbilt was ruthless with weight reduction. Engineers were grabbing a pound here and slicing a pound there. The result was a truck that, despite all the additional hardware, is still more than 1,300 pounds lighter than a typical Model 579 pulling a standard dry van trailer. On the tractor side, we were able to take roughly 700 pounds off the truck. On the trailer side, a lot more aerodynamic features went on, so a lot more opportunity to take weight off there as well. The net effect was 1,305 pounds of weight reduction compared to our baseline truck. So that equates to about a 4% freight ton economy improvement by itself. We focused on the heaviest components in the truck and that tend tends to be below the cab level, basically in the chassis. We started with the frame rails. We used what would be called a variable gauge steel frame rail where the flanges were very thick but the web was very thin. And then we went about taking additional weight out by punching lightweighting holes throughout the frame. So we ended up with about 250 pounds of frame rail reduction over a full thickness frame rail. Additional changes we made were uh, we used magnesium cross members to replace aluminum cross members. Magnesium is about two-thirds the density of aluminum so took 10 pounds off in three different places on the chassis there. One of the big, most uh, hard-hitting changes we were really impressed with was aluminum composite brake drums. This is a uh, process that was in, under an investigation with the Department of Army prior to us coming across it, and we decided to engage a company in making 16 half by 7 brake drums for the first time that took about 50 pounds off per wheel end over cast iron brake drums. What we were most surprised with was how well they performed. Because they are an aluminum composite, they don't heat up, and so that the fade and squeal and and overall endurance and durability of the brake drum is shown to be extremely attractive. So you get the weight reduction as well as potentially better performing than conventional brake drums. That's a win-win. That's just a few of the more pioneering weight reduction technologies. There were others too, like an aluminum fifth wheel and drive shaft, aluminum trailer frame and subfloor, wide base single tires on aluminum wheels, lithium ion hotel load batteries and more. Almost all of those weight saving components will find their way onto production trucks sometime soon, but they aren't for everyone. Nobody running lightweight loads is going to pay any extra money for weight reduction, but those components will certainly appeal to fuel haulers and anyone else who runs at or close to maximum gross weight. Peterbilt and Cummins tapped the expertise and imagination of 14 industry suppliers to make the super truck a reality. Those partners include Purdue University, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Modine, Cooper Busman, Corvus, SAF Holland, Dana, Hendrickson, Alcoa, Firestone, Bendix, Metalsa, Meridian, Eaton, Century Incorporated, <laughs> Continental, Exa, and their motor carrier proof of concept advisor, US Express. The third video in our super truck series looks at some of the onboard technology that made those dramatic improvements in efficiency possible. Part one is an overview of the truck and the project, and the fourth video in the series highlights the many aerodynamic features on the truck. Check them out as well. From Denton, Texas, I'm Jim Park for today's Trucking's Ultimate Test Drive Series. Drive safe and keep your revs down.